In this clip I will provide a proof of the extreme value theorem. And extreme value theorem says that a continuous function on a closed interval attains a global maximum and a global minimum. Well, as a first step, we claim the claim is that a continuous function on a closed interval should be bounded. Yeah, what does it say? Well, a bounded function, for a bounded function, there should be a constant larger than zero so that the absolute value of fx is smaller or equal than c for any x in a, b. Yeah, so here is the condition, so the absolute value of fx is smaller or equal than some number c. Well, the proof goes by contradiction, so suppose that f is not bounded on a, b. Uh, and if it's not bounded by a, b, then we use a kind of bisection argument that we split the interval a, b in two pieces and then f should be unbounded on one of the two intervals, uh, the left interval or the right interval. Uh, so, more precisely, more precisely, we take the midpoint of the interval, which is given by the number z equals a half times a plus b, and this is the middle of the interval, then if f is unbounded, then at least on one of the sets a, z, and z, b, f should be unbounded. Yeah, so f is unbounded on a, z, or z, b. Now we construct a second interval. So given a, b, now we turn into uh, an interval, closed interval, a1 and b1, where a1, b1 is just the half on which f is unbounded. Yeah, and if we have some kind of flexibility in the sense that uh, the function is unbounded on, on both intervals a, z and z, b, then suppose we just pick the left one, so a, z. Yeah? So that's the default option in case f is unbounded on both parts. What I try to achieve is that we have take the halves of uh, at each time we bisect the interval and create an interval of length a half of the original one such that f is unbounded on the remaining piece yeah so if we have a choice we could pick the leftmost one and now we continue by bisecting so given a1, b1, we consider the number z1 equals a half times a1 plus b1. And again, we look at a1, z1, and uh, uh, z1, b1, and pick the interval which carries the unbounded part of f. So, and this will be the part that we define to be a2, b2, etc. Now we pick a2, b2, construct an interval on which of half the size a3, b3, on which f is again unbounded and so forth. Yeah, so, each time we define a new interval of half the length on which f is unbounded. Yeah, so we define a sequence of intervals where the length of a and b and the nth interval in this sequence is exactly equal to b minus a divided by 2 to the power n. Now look at the set of left endpoints of these intervals. So consider the set a and we summarize all left endpoints of the interval. So a1, a2, and so forth. These are maybe infinitely many members. And this is a set of left endpoints. 
then what we may conclude is that this set is non-empty and it's in fact bounded from above by B since these are left endpoints and these are always smaller they are picked from the set from the interval AB so all the elements, the left endpoints AK are at most B and this means that A is bounded right so we have an non-empty set that is bounded so the axiom of the completeness axiom of the real number states that alpha equals the supremum of A exists yeah, so we can take the supremum of the set A well f is a continuous function so f is also continuous in alpha well f is continuous on the interval a b so f is in particular continuous in in alpha which is a member the uh, supremum of a is of course contained in a b so f is continuous in alpha and if f is continuous in alpha then close to alpha um, so, say, on an interval around alpha, alpha minus delta and alpha plus delta for very small delta, then it should hold that the absolute value of fx minus f alpha is smaller than 1. Yeah, we could take other numbers, but fx is going to be close to f alpha. And the distance from fx to f alpha is in particular smaller than 1, for an interval, small enough interval around alpha. So here implicitly we assume that uh, alpha is in the middle of the interval AB so that we can have an alpha minus delta and alpha plus delta being belonging to AB. But if it happens that alpha is the left point or just A, then we can of course also take an interval of type i delta equals alpha and alpha plus delta or if alpha happens to be b then alpha minus delta b yeah so this is not really crucial that alpha belongs to the middle of the interval a b we can adjust the proof just like that. The most important thing is that close to f alpha, we have that the absolute value of fx minus f alpha is bounded, or fx minus f alpha in absolute value is smaller than one. Well, if it if that is the case, then we know, of course, that the absolute value differs not so much from f alpha. So the absolute value in x on such an interval is smaller than one plus the function value an absolute value in alpha but this means that f is bounded yeah on this interval f is bounded by 1 plus the absolute value of f in alpha well this leads to the necessary contradiction because if we look at the intervals of type A and B and then we can pick n so large that A and B and is contained in the set I delta. Yeah, because these are intervals where alpha is present and every time for a higher index number n we bisect the interval so it has a length uh, going to zero so by picking n so large and uh, larger than delta divided by 2 over n we see that a n b n is contained in i delta yeah but this is not correct because we assume that we pick those those intervals a n b n um, for the reason that f is unbounded on a and b n but now we've shown that actually f should be bounded so this contradicts unboundedness 
So this proves our claim or step one of the proof of the extreme value theorem. Step two in the proof of the extreme value theorem consists of showing that the supremum of f and the infimum of f are actually attained in the interval a, b, so that actually the supremum is a maximum and the infimum is a minimum. Uh, from step one we know that f is a bounded function, yeah, so continuity together with the closed interval a, b shows that f is bounded. So in particular, it's bounded from below and above. So, since the function values, the set of all function values is non empty, then we may define the supremum of f over ab. Yeah, so, we may define two numbers sub f, which is the supremum of the set containing all function values for x in the range from A to B and the infimum of F, inf F the infimum over the set of all function values so we have that the infimum inf f is smaller or equal than fx and is smaller or equal than the sub f for all x in a b so our first claim is that f attains sub f on a b then if we can show this then there's shows that f attains a maximum, that actually the supremum of f equals the maximum of f over ab. Okay, the proof is as follows. We write capital M for sub f, just for convenience. Yeah, so write capital M for sub f and again we will use a proof by contradiction so suppose that there is no x in a b with fx equals m so which means mean that the sub f is not attained so we do know that the supremum exists but suppose it's not attained and so then there is no x with fx equals m now we define a help function, a function g of x, which equals the difference between m and fx. Yeah, so g of x is defined on a, b, and it's defined as m minus fx. Then, of course, since fx is always smaller or equal than sub f, or capital M, and we see that when it's never equal to m, then g of x is always larger than zero on a, b. Well, g is a continuous function, so 1 over g is a continuous function on a, b. Now we apply the former step. It took a lot of courage to show that any continuous function on a b was bounded but now we know that by step one that one over g since it's a continuous function on a b that one over g is bounded so we we find there should be a c such that one over g of x is smaller or equal than c for all x contained in a b yeah, 1 over g is smaller or equal than c for all x's belonging to the closed interval a, b. Well, this is just the same since uh, and 1 over g is positive, then c is also strictly positive. So this is just the same as saying that g of x is larger or equal than 1 over c for all x. 
But then m minus fx, well, by definition g of x is m minus fx, then m minus fx is larger or equal than 1 over c. Yeah, so that fx is smaller or equal than m minus 1 over c. Yeah, for some positive number c. Yeah, but that's a strange thing, right? Because we now have c, a positive number. So m minus 1 over c is smaller than m. Strictly smaller than m. So we know that f is smaller than m minus 1 over c, but also that m is the supremum of f. Yeah, so the supremum of f is supposed to be the lowest upper bound. But basically now we see that m cannot be the lowest upper bound since we found the lower one, m minus 1 over c. So this leads to a contradiction. And in particular we conclude that the only thing we assumed here is that there is no x such that fx equals m. So we should now conclude that there must be an x in a in the, in the closed interval a, b such that fx equals m. So there must be an x in a, b such that fx equals the supremum of f. And this shows that f attains a maximum on the interval AB. And so we're done with the supremum of f, now the infimum. Yeah, now we should uh, be able to prove that f attains the infimum of f on the interval. Well, this is rather easy. Just re realize that uh, we can apply the above to minus f. Yeah, just apply the above reasoning to minus f. As we see, it's not hard to realize that the infimum of f is minus the supremum of minus f. Yeah, f is a continuous function on the closed interval a, b. So minus f is a continuous function on the closed interval a, b. So the supremum exists and is a team. So if we also know that the infimum of f being minus the supremum of minus f is a team from so, for some value in the closed interval a, b. And this concludes the proof of the extreme value theorem.